to England. This is my seventh trip to preach in this country. I understand that seven is the perfect number. And thank you for bringing my dear wife with me. Since we last saw you, we have buried a son. We both have had cancer. We both are cancer survivors. Lee in 2008 and Sister Wright in 2009. And we've discovered that God heals. Uh, can I get a witness in this place? God heals. We serve a prayer answering God. I'm trying to stay calm. I don't want to start preaching yet, but I just want to celebrate a prayer answering God. My last trip here was in 2001. <clears throat> I landed on that fateful night before 9-1-1. Pastor Lomacain and I, some of you recall, did the camp meeting together. And he decided to stay by and sightsee. He didn't see home for three weeks. All flights over our country were canceled. I woke up the next morning to discover that our country had been attacked. And so I'll never forget that trip to England. These are serious times. I said, these are serious times. The world economy is in a fractured condition. In our country, people are losing their homes. People with long time positions are being let go after 25, 30 years of work. The wars and rumors of wars increase. And the members of the church must be sure they're not just standing by playing the violin while Rome burns. Are you listening to me? And so I've not come during this period to entertain you with preaching. We have a word from the Lord. I've come with a word from the Lord. The brethren have chosen the team, the theme, Revive, Revive, from that prefix, again, Vive, Viva, Life, Live Again. Revive means to live again, which means you were once alive, lost life, and have regained it spend the week talking about what it means to revive. Tomorrow night you want to prepare for me by reading John the fifth chapter. Revive your hope. I want to thank Pastor Sweeney. That was the best introduction I've ever had. Genius. You know we go on and on about a person. We and my, my conviction is, if, if a person can preach, you'll know it in a few minutes. If they can't, all the induction in the world's not going to change your disappointment. Can I get a witness in this place? So thank you, my brother. Just, just let the man preach, if he can. Let's pray. Lord, we're going to go to work now. So enter in with us. Your sermon, your camp meeting, your people, your word, your spirit, your son. 
I'm your servant, so take charge of your stuff and bring it to pass. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Still got a little ring, Andre, you got to work with that. Revelation, the book of Revelation. You did bring your Bible to camp meeting, didn't you? It is an interesting book. Uh, the book of Revelation. Ellen G. White, you know who she is, don't you? Yeah. Ellen G. White says that all the books of the Bible end in Revelation. All the loose cords, all the loose ends, all the unfinished stuff <laughs> gets finished in Revelation. She also says that if you had no other book of the Bible but Revelation, you'd have the whole gospel. And it is fitting that the last book of the Bible is not only inspired by the Holy Spirit, as all Scripture is, but this particular book, the book of Revelation, according to the introduction, is, 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 is Jesus Christ himself, the one who is the subject, the apex, the, the focus, the heart, the hub, the nexus, the kerygma of the Bible. Jesus Christ is the one who inspires and speaks in Revelation. And so the book is delicious. It's, it's full of truth. It, it, it is Christ explaining himself to us. And so in John's introduction, he makes it clear that Jesus is about to speak. And, 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 and so the book is pregnant with how Jesus feels about the church. If you take the book, uh, chapters 1 through 11... Uh, the, the, the three sevens, the, the seven churches and the seven seals and the, and the seven trumpets. Uh, that's the first 11 chapters and they're all historical. The seven, the seven uh, churches deal with the spiritual history of the church. The seven seals, the, the ecclesiastical history of the church. The, the seven trumpets, the, the political world in which the church must develop spiritually and ecclesiastically. And then in chapter 12, the great controversy is summarized. Chapter 13, the enemy of all righteousness and his, and his tools are introduced. Chapter 14, the work of the church. Chapter 15, the, 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 the seven last plagues. And 16, the seven last plagues. Uh, chapter 17 and 18, the end of the enemies of God's church. Chapter 19, the triumph of the church. Chapter 20, God's judgment of the earth. Chapter 21 and 22, everything's going to be good. I just preached Revelation, chapters 1 through 22. But what caught my attention, what stirred the preacher's mind, are the words that begin the seven churches. They are words, my brother, of revival. Words of what? Revival is in Revelation. Turn to somebody and say it. Tell them revival's in Revelation. Tell them right now. Revival's in Revelation. Tell somebody revival's in Revelation. Tell somebody revival is in Revelation. It's right there. Ah, oh, that's enough. You said enough. You said enough. They got it. They got it. Revival is there. And I know this. I know this because of how the message to the seven churches starts. And it sets the theme for the whole book. Now, before you can appreciate, before you can masticate and digest Revelation, you must understand that this book is written to the church. John is on Patmos. It's sometime between 95 and 105 AD. The scholars debate about it. He's been placed there by the emperor. He was proven to be fireproof, tried to burn him up in oil, couldn't do it. You know, God's people to something else, you know. Don't mess with God's folk. He'll surprise you every time. Tried to burn the old brother up. He got up out the oil and kept on going. I'll say amen for you. Hallelujah. Thank God. Put him on Patmos. Tried to work him to death. 
But one morning on Sabbath morning, the Spirit of the Lord came, spoke to John, and, 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 and gave him messages to the seven churches, or the complete church, or the whole church, or the whole family, or the whole organization is in this message to the churches. You're named Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos and Sardis and Philadelphia, Laodicea, so no, they're all there. Thyatira, they're all there. They're all there. They're named. They're named. We'll talk about, talk about that in a few minutes, but they're there. But it's the first message that sets the tone. Go there with me. Uh, Revelation, the second chapter. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that hideth, holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works. There it is. You see it? What did you see? I know thy works. Now note that phrase. Note that phrase. Uh, Revelation 2, verse 2 I know thy works. Look at verse 9. I know thy works. Look at verse 13. I know thy works. Look at verse 19. I know thy works. Look at chapter 3 and verse 1. I know thy works. Uh, look at the chapter, verse 15. I know thy works. I know thy works. Now, you know, you know, that's, that's, that's both comforting and a bit unnerving. Ah, Jesus is saying, I know you. Ha! Yeah, with your deacon self and your deaconess self and your treasurer self and your elder self and your pastor self and your choir member self, I know you. You can posture and, and, and pretend and strut all you want, but I know you. Lord, have mercy. God knows me. All the secret stuff I've been hiding, all the things I don't want anybody to know, God knows me. Now, there's a comfort in it. Because since he knows me, that means he knows how to treat me. That means he'll be fair with me. I mean, God, that means that God, if God knows me and knows all the ugliness about me and still loves me, that's good news. Oh, shoot, I'll celebrate by myself. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. How can you stay calm about that? God knowing your dirt, knowing your secrets, but he, he, he loves you. I know you, but I love you. Most folk, if they really knew you, they wouldn't love you. Go on and nod your head and say amen. Don't look to the right or to the left. Yeah. But I know you. And he says it to every church. So, so it's Ephesus, I know you. It's Smyrna, I know you. It's, 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 it's uh, Pergamos, I know you. It's, it's Thyatira, I know you. It's Sardis, I know you. Philadelphia, I know you. Laodicea, I know you. It's right there in the Bible. Now, Having said that he knows us, note how the book of Revelation starts the revival message of the book. And I'm telling you tonight that the whole book is about revival. Here it is. I know thy works, verse 2, has borne with you, verse 3, have some stuff against you, verse 4. Now verse 5, here's revival, young lady, here it is right here in the Bible, revival. Verse 5, remember, what word? Say it, everybody, what word? Remember. remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. What's the next word? Remember, repent. And then it says, and do the first works. Let's sum it up. Return. Remember, repent, return. Say it. Remember, repent, return. One more time. Remember, repent. Return. All right, pastors, we got us something here. We can work with this. Jesus is talking to the church, Pastor Surich, and he says, here's the thing I want you to do. First, remember. See, we're talking about revival. Revival begins with remembering what God, I'm trying to stay calm, remembering <laughs> what God has done for me. <laughs> yes, sir, you want to have revival? You want to get your giddy up going? You want to rise up out of your seat and feel good about yourself. Remember how God brought you through. Remember how he raised you up. Remember how he saved you from yourself. Remember the goodness of God when you didn't have money to pay your bills. Remember how God saved you from yourself when you're acting like a fool. Remember. You want to have revival. Remember. That'll save marriages, you know. Yeah, I remember when she wasn't so large and remember when she 
Remember when he was real handsome and remember, how come y'all getting quiet? <laughs> remember when you were calling her sweet and you were calling him, remember, go back, go back. Maybe I can preach two sermons at the same time, remember. Repent, repent, repent means to change direction. Yeah, my brother, remember, repent, return. No, no, no. I am suggesting to you that those three words embrace the entire book. And he's talking. This is what Pastor McFarlane gets me so upset. He is talking. Pastor McFarlane's over here. I got to make sure he's listening to me. He is talking. He is talking to the church. No, no, y'all don't have it yet. He's not talking to sinners. He's saying to church members, remember. He's saying to church members, repent. He's saying to church folks, return. Surely church people have remembered, repented, and returned. So something has happened to the church in just the first 50, 60 years of his existence, because he's writing this around 95 to 105 A.D., the church is barely 60 years old, and already, man, I'm trying to stay calm, already, Lord have mercy, already God sees slippage. I will, ma'am. <laughs> Already, God sees slippage in the new church. Are you listening to me? Do you think that maybe Seventh-day Adventist believers ought to get this word? Christ is upset. One of the hardest things to do is to be consistent. I have preached this for years, so I might as well preach it here. The worst sin in the church is not, is not lying or adultery or, or worst sin in the church is inconsistency. We just don't stay with it. Come on, somebody. Hey, 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 sometimes up, sometimes down. I hate that song. Hope the praise team has not planned that for this week because that's that, that going to fly with me. <laughs> These are the last days. God, <laughs> God needs his people to rise up on their tiptoes of faith and be consistent about Sabbath keeping, consistent about worship, consistent about returning time, consistent in mercy, consistent in forgiveness, consistent in faith, consistent. We don't have time to be down. It's time to get up and stay up. The song says, rise up, O men of God. This up and down flow. And when you study the seven churches, Ephesus, lost the first love, Smyrna. So when you lose the first love, then God sends you to Smyrna. Persecute you. And sometimes we don't come out of Smyrna pure, so we go to Pergamos, compromise. And then if you compromise long enough, you wind up in Thyatira, apostasy. Are you with me? Then you try to come out of Thyatira, uh, you, get, you, get to, you, you get to Sardis, uh, not everything is straight. And so then God persecutes you one more time. Philadelphia, if you don't re re respond to that, you wind up in Laodicea, neither hot nor cold. Seven churches. And, and there's this, uh, I don't know whether you have them here, I'm sure you do. We, when we call them roller coasters. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
Have you noticed? By the time the ride is over, you're sick as a dog. No, folk, we can see, we, uh, 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 I'm, 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 I'm going to get into this real deep this week. See, we, we, we need a revival. We need a revival. We need a revival that, that, that really purifies the church of this kind of uh, egocentric, self-flagellation, uh, always worried about self, uh, always concerned about self, uh, egotistical, me first, kind of Seventh-day Adventist religion that has forgotten we've been called by God to reach out. We don't have time to be constantly worried about ourselves and our problems. God has given us the work of the church to get the church minds off itself. We should be so wrapped up in the mission of God, we have no time Amen. to be inconsistent. Revive. It's all there. Lost your first love. Now, how does that happen? I mean, you don't enjoy Sabbath school anymore? I mean, how, how, please help me understand. How, how do you reach the point where you don't enjoy the Bible anymore? You don't enjoy going to church? How does that happen anymore? You don't enjoy being kind and considerate anymore? I mean, what is this loss of first love? We have forgotten the essence of the relationship. We've become list makers. We think because we've kept so many Sabbaths and returned so much time, and not a number of missionary things, that this is proof of a relationship. Well, the Pharisees will keep the Sabbath better than you ever thought. They even paid tithe on their cologne and perfume. You ain't never done that. Ain't is a word we use in America. You ain't never done that. They counted their steps on the Sabbath. They were punctilious about religion and then crucified Jesus. See, notice, he did not say they lost their Sabbath keeping. They lost their carrot juice and celery juice. They lost their long dresses. He said, you lost your love. Are you listening to me, church? The essence of the church is love. This is why the church is full <laughs> of all different kinds of people. The church is designed to test your love. They don't sit there all pious. You know there's some folks you go to church with you don't like. I'll say amen for you. Don't want to hear them call. Don't want to hear the sound of their voice. See, some of you bowing your heads. You're thinking about it now. Your heads are going down. Are you with me? See, I, 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 I'm convinced that anybody who can be a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and love all the people they go to church with is ready for heaven. That's why the church is made up of black and white and, and yellow and red and striped and polka dot and short and tall and fat and skinny and intelligent and not so ed educated. All kinds of people are in the church, people that are patient, people that are impatient, uh, uh, cholerics and melancholics and phlegmatics and sanguines are all in the church. God brings them all in the church just for you. Yes, sir, just for you. People who stand by in church and sing off-key the whole hymn, he brought them right for you. People, people, people who don't brush their teeth good when they come to church, and so they breathe on you when they worship. Why are y'all sitting there pious? You know I'm telling the truth. People who the very sound of their voice gets on your nerves, they're in the church. If you can embrace them with the love of God, you're ready for glory. 
You've lost your love. Go back and do the first works. Yeah. Yeah. Do the first works. Brother called me. Elder. Late one night. Elder. Yes, I recognize his voice. He said, Elder. It's gone. It's gone. I mean, what's gone? The thrill is gone, Elder. What? Me and the missus, Elder? It's gone. The thrill is gone. I said, well, what happened? I don't know, Elder. Just there's nothing, nothing going on here anymore. I said, well, return and do the first works. <laughs> Sweetie, that's what I told him. So return. What do you mean, Elder? I said, well, how did you win her? Well, flowers, Elder. Dinner, Elder. I said, well, get to it, my brother. Return and do the first works. He started this, that, and the other. About a month later, he calls me up, Elder. Elder, things are going better now. <laughs> Good. He said, don't hang up, Elder. Listen. Elder told me, listen. I said, I hear music. Elder, I came in. Music playing. Meal set. Flowers on the table. Elder, she's all perfumed. <laughs> Special dress. I said, well, praise God. No, 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 Elder. Elder, what do I do now? I said, brother, I can't help you now. <laughs> I made you smile purposely. That was intentional. That was intentional. That was intentional. You see, listen to me. He let go of the sinful things. We're so busy trying to find something special to do. Just be nice. Just be kind. Just say I'm sorry. Just be consistent. We're trying to find some great Mount Everest to climb. Just cross the pond. The Christian life is based on four things. How many did I say? How many did I say? Repeat after me. First prayer. Talk to me. First prayer. Bible study. Worship. Christian service. You can preach all day long. You'll never come up with anything better than those four. Your whole Christian experience is based on those four. If you pray, if you study, if you worship, if you do God's work, your life becomes solid and steady and firm. Unfortunately, we're looking for some great event in the last days to make us righteous. Just do the basics. Prayer works if you pray. Can I get a witness? Amen. Bible study enriches the mind if you study it. And in this day when the devil has sneaked through the back door into the computer and allows men and women to pollute their souls and their minds with pornography and foolishness in the privacy of their home, the church must rekindle itself, guard itself, we must treat our minds as treasures. How dare we let God's territory be polluted by the presence of Satan? The basic stuff. And that's why you come to camp meeting, to be reminded that it's the simple things, the little things that count. My dear brother, my dear sister, my dear young person, that the, the, the basic stuff saves us from sin and from destruction. Jesus tarries with his church, persecutes them, and then loves them through Pergamos and stays with them through Thyatira. You know, the message of Thyatira is, 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 is serious. In Thyatira, the church is talked about like a prostitute. He 
even when you make the devil your lover, Jesus doesn't give up on you. It's to Thyatira. I'm going to tell them over here. It's to Thyatira. It's in that message that the Bible says there's still something left. Don't ever give up on anybody. And then half-baked Sardis, uh, the Reformation, they didn't go all the way back, and then the test of Philadelphia, and then Laodicea, and there's Jesus, and there's Jesus. And it gets so bad, it gets so bad, you, you know the end of the message, don't you? Sure you do. By the time you get to Laodicea, you read these serious words. Verse 20, Revelation 3, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. How do we get from Ephesus, loss of first love, to Jesus outside? Outside. Knocking to get in. This ought to break your heart. It breaks his. And then the text gets more vivid. If any man hear my voice, which means he's not just knocking. He's not just knocking. He's calling to the church, let me in. But there, but there, but their lifestyle has turned up too loud. They cannot hear their Lord. They've gotten wrapped up in their own thing. They cannot hear Jesus. He's knocking and calling, and he still can't get in. You ought to be upset tonight. Greek says, I have been standing and I have been knocking for a long time. When you lost your first love, I started knocking. Through Smyrna, I'm knocking. Pergamos, I'm knocking. Thyatira, still knocking. Sardis, calling. Philadelphia, calling and knocking. Laodicea, Jesus does not give up. That's why some of you are here tonight, because when the church gave up, Jesus did not give up. When your family gave up, Jesus did not give up. When folk gave up, you were loved and kept and pulled, saved and sugared, protected by Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! He knocked through your drugs, knocked through your liquor, knocked through your carousing. He kept on knocking and calling. And when you were broken and nobody expected you to come back to church, the Spirit grabbed you and your weakness brought you back in the church. And when nobody thought you would, you walked down the aisle, gave yourself to Jesus Christ, responded to his call. Somebody ought to say amen out there. Thank God for Jesus. Behold, I stand, I knock. If any man will just hear, I'll come in, sit down with him, share food with him. I love telling the story of Jesus' love. Marvelous, unspeakable, indescribable, patient, long-lasting, enduring, you can't wear it out, love. Here's what's so pretty. I'm almost done. I don't preach real long, just preach long enough. <laughs> Here's what's pretty. When you get down to the end of chapter 3, 7 churches, church in bad shape, bad shape, bad shape, bad shape. And because it's so pitiful, then the Bible shifts to chapter 4, the scene in heaven. And then in chapter 5, remember, uh, there's, there's, there's this book of deeds, uh, the book, remember the book? Does anybody remember the book? 
and there's nobody, the deeds represent the title to planet earth, and, and nobody is able to open the book. And, and John starts crying, and the angel says, look up! <laughs> there's the line of the tribe of Judah. He is able to open the book. Then in chapter 6 are the seals, all but eight, all but one. And then chapter 7, I'm rushing to chapter 7. Chapter 7 is good, y'all, chapter 7. Now, I'm, I'm going to get you out there. I don't care whether you listen to me or not now because I'm in chapter 7, and I love that chapter because by the time you get to the end of chapter 3, you wonder if anybody's going to be saved. Come on, somebody. Don't look good. He's outside. He's knocking. They're hot. They're cold. They're neither one of those. They, they, they need eyes salve. They, they're picked in the church. It's pitiful, and John can't take it. And then the Bible shows him chapter 7 and the angel sealing the seal. You remember that? Now, in chapter 5, you see 24 elders in heaven, redeemed from the earth. So you know 24 are going to be saved. Yay, boy. Happy for the 24. And then beginning of chapter 7, there's 144,000. Remember that? Yeah, but that's tight. How many Adventists y'all got in Britain? Huh? Huh? 32, 32,000? I guess I can get in there then, 144,000. But that number's tight. Isn't that number tight? Yeah, you know that number's too tight. Ah! <laughs> I'm sorry now. I'm all by myself now. John! What, Lord? Look a little bit higher. John comes up over the mountain of the vision. And there he sees a number. Hey, 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 hey! A number which no man can number. Standing on the sea of glass. White robes on their body. Palms in their hands. I think there's room for you. And I think there's room for me. And even though the church winds up at the end of chapter 3 in bad shape, God is so successful. He finally saved so many people that they cannot be counted Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The church shall be revived. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. Revived. We're going to be revived, brother. You and those folk on the front row, there's room for us. It's a number which no man can number. Can you say amen, my brother? You pastors here in this, 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 this great country of Wales, God bless you. Not only you, but those you labor for and others. There's room. Why? There's a number which no man can number. Pastor McFarlane, we can lift our sights. There's still room for somebody else in England to come to Jesus Christ and be saved. Why? John saw a number which no man can number. I can go back home to the United States and preach my head off. Why? There's still room for somebody to come to God. Because there's a number which no man can number. And so we can commit our we can commit ourselves to Jesus. Just as I am. as I am, we can come, just as I am, we can come, well it's going to rough here pastor, kind of messed up this year, came to practice, came to camp meeting, kind of broken up, messed up, need to be fixed up, now, he'll take you like you are, you got scars on your soul, he'll take you like you are. Faith a bit dim. He'll take your dim faith. He'll work with you. Hope diminished. Talk about that tomorrow night. He'll take the hope you have. the 
earth was formed, God saw this night. See, the reason why Pastor Wright preaches with such fervor, I believe every time I preach, it's an appointment with God. Every person in this room tonight, Jesus saw you before you were born in this room tonight and me preaching. He knew you would hear the sermon. Why you? Why you here now tonight? Sermons are not accidents. Sermons are the direct act of God towards certain hearts. You were meant, my dear lady, to hear this sermon. So you sitting back there in the gallery, why you? Why this sermon? Why this night? What did God say to you over there? Why did you arrive in time? Bow your head. Bow your head. Let's, let's finish with a prayer. Let's finish with a prayer. Now, Lord, this assignment is too big for Henry Wright. There's absolutely nothing, there's absolutely nothing great about my preaching, and there's absolutely even less great about me. So this is your doing. This assignment is beyond me and all of us workshop leaders and speakers that the job's too big for us but you designed it and so these singers are saying to us God will receive us tonight as we are that's the appeal to your heart tonight revive Jesus never gives up on his church and one day the church triumphant shall stand before God. Now how come you shouldn't be in that number? Think about it. What's preventing you? Think about it. What's the shackles? Think about it. What's the fear? Think about it. What's the problem? Think about it. And tonight in the quietness of your seat, say, Lord, help me. Deliver me from me. And thank you for knocking on my door tonight until I hurt you. We commend now, Lord, this camp meeting, this congregation to you. You have set the stage and the theme. You're accepting us as we are. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. In his sweet name we pray. And the people said, amen. God bless you. Tomorrow night, revive your hope. Chapter 5, the book of John.